everybody. I'm Pastor AJ Hausman, and welcome to Shit They Don't Tell You on Sunday, a podcast to dig deeper into aspects of the Bible get glossed over or totally ignored in most preaching. The Bible has a lot of parts that are racy, uncomfortable, and sometimes downright horrifying. Let's talk about it. Well, welcome everybody to episode 19. Today we have our first repeat guest. Um, by popular demand, of course, um, the Reverend Chris Schaefer, Hello. who is the pastor of Divinity Lutheran Church in Towson, Maryland. True. He is not in my home today. We're being professionals in our offices. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we're consummate professionals. I think that's really right. one of the first things mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. use to describe us. Mm-hmm. That's definitely it. <laughs> Um, today we're going to dive into, um, the fun topic of queer theology as a part of our mini series. Uh, so we're kind of just discussing some topics to really dig into, um, you know, our, our life in the 21st century. Um, and for the next, wait, this is the middle. Sometimes I record these out of order and then I forget where I'm at, but we're in the middle of talking about um, three uh, different um, sects of theological oh, yes. views mm-hmm. under liberation, under the liberation um, theology umbrella. Yeah. Which is, is yeah. where we get, you know, it's where our cool queer theology comes from. Listen, I am honored to be uh, amongst the presence of such theological giants as you are having uh, on um, uh, uh, to talk about these various theologies. They are oh, just the best of the best. Uh, me too. And opinion. sometimes yeah. I'm continually surprised that people say yes to me for this. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not paying them. I No, I, it's just because we are nerds and we love to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think also that I think every single person um, that, you know, has been a podcast guest and probably ever will be a, a guest on Shit They Don't Tell You on Sunday are people that um, feel passionately about the Bible and about um, their faith and theology um, and also feel passionately um, that we can continue to share this good news in a way that is not damaging like it has been for Mm. a long ass time. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, 100%, absolutely, yep. Reclaiming our theology, as you can say. I, or I, I, yeah, deconstructing mm-hmm. it. <laughs> Indeed, hot topic. Um, <laughs> yeah, especially if you uh, are on uh, theology Twitter, deconstruction is all the rage these days. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's a big part of kind of the uh, the evangelical movement, I think. Uh, but basically, it's you know, and I think it really aligns well with queer theology because this it's this whole process of having to kind of take uh, a lot of theology that was given to us, taught to us, right? Perhaps when we were, if we were growing up, if we grew up in the church, uh, and when we kind of come to realize that maybe it's not uh, all the Sunday school um, uh, answers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they don't really work anymore, right? And so we kind of have to take it apart. And and sometimes it's really, really difficult. I mean, I got to a point where I'm like, I don't know what I believe anymore. Everything's just been shattered. Um, I'm like, I don't even know if I even have pieces to put back together again. Uh, but the beauty of deconstruction is sometimes, um, you know, it's kind of like when there's these massive wildfires that, you know, it's it's hard and it's dangerous. And afterwards, there is new life that comes out of the ground. And sometimes mm-hmm. you kind of almost need to, right? Because there's some really beautiful fertile ground underneath the rubble, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so I think that's uh, actually one of the gifts that, um, uh, that we have, you know, and I mean, the word theology is, just, it literally just means God talk, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. there's not necessarily like a, uh, an absolute right or absolute wrong or whatever, right? But it's, it's how do you talk about God and in a way that is meaningful and true for you, for your lived experience. And that might not be the same for somebody else, but I think that's kind of the, again, one of the gifts of all the liberation theologies, really. Yeah. Sometimes I like to think, um, uh, that's sort of this deconstruction idea that we do with theology is like uh, it's like growing up a little bit you know like yeah. um when you were a kid everything was you know the basic 
view right like you know Noah mm-hmm. took all the cute animals onto the boat and then you're an adult and you're like oh man everybody dies in that story yeah. except like four people um right. you know, it's kind of, <laughs> that wasn't process, part of the right? felt board the, yeah that wasn't uh, up there i don't <laughs> Um, I always like to use that as a prime example of really what it means for us in theology to just look at it differently. Like yeah, all the okay. Bible stories that we were taught as kids. Um, and even, you know, um, this one does a better job than most, the Spark Story Bible um, it's true. Yeah. Of, of leaving in some of those harder parts, but still like, yeah. does it Making mistake it accessible. And over right. kind of, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, well, and I think, you know, it's something that we're discovering uh, the more that we learn about like science and childhood development that, you know, that we can handle actually a lot more than we think we can. And that the Lord knows that's true with talking any anything about queer subjects. Right. Because, you you know, that standard response. How am I going to explain this to my kids? I'm, but well, I, I think anybody in their theology at some point, excuse me, if you grew up in the church at some point in time, you had to bridge that gap between 100%. what you learned in Sunday school and what I would say a more mature and authentic theology as an adult, right? Are you talking about walking the Bridgeless Canyon, uh, AJ Hussman? Um, uh... Getting ahead of me with these resources, <laughs> but yes, sure. We'll share resources, yes, no, I. but there's, that's the thing, right? Like we, we've had to put the work in um, and uh, I think in many ways that kind of makes our theology stronger when we have to go through this process of deconstruction, it's often painful and messy. And uh, in many ways, I think a lot of folks who have gone through that process and have kind of come to embrace queer theology, we know a, a shit ton about scripture, to be honest, yeah. um, right? And theology because- Because we've done we the work. <laughs> yeah, we they've actually do done it. the work to pull it apart, right. right? So it's not just like this blanket, immature theology of someone saying, oh, well, the Bible says that being gay is bad. I'm like, well, actually it doesn't, but you have to put in the work in order to realize that, you know, do do a little exegesis, maybe learn a little Greek or, you know, maybe just. Yeah, for fun, you know, as one does. Um, uh, (laughs) Well, but this is the thing. I think, you know, for those of us who feel passionate about this, uh, it's, you know, these are just incredible tools. It's not like we're just making this up. This isn't eisegesis, right? We're not just like putting what we want to into right. the text. Mm-hmm. We, this is kind of like your example of Noah's Ark. The genocide is in there, right? But that's not usually the part that gets focused on. So mm-hmm. it's not like we're just putting stuff into these stories. We're taking yeah, out maybe it's... things and aspects that have gotten glossed over or that maybe people with other different worldviews, different lived experiences um, uh, maybe didn't have access to. And that's, again, that's kind of, the gift of uh of being queer yeah exactly well yeah. okay well so let's dive into a little bit about what what is you know queer theology you know yeah um so we start have to kind of start to figure out like you know the very basic what how how do you how do we define queer Oof. heavy um yeah right like it's it's big um uh, I think queer has kind of become a, a bit of a loaded word um, recently just because uh, for recently? a long time. Uh, well, I mean, even more so recently, I should say, um, uh, in, or in new ways, because for a long time, right, like it meant kind of odd, weird, something that was just queer, right? It was just different. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think a lot of LGBTQ plus folks uh, have been regarded by others that were traditionally considered the norm or centered, right, Uh, would regard LGBTQ folks in terms of how they talked and spoke and acted and were in community with each other, like, that's weird, that's different, that's not uh, normal, right? Um, And so eventually, I think one of the gifts uh, of being LGBTQ uh, and along with other marginalized identities is that we kind of learned to to turn the insult, so to speak, right? Like, uh, and that's where that reclaiming piece that you're talking about comes in, where we, you know, queer was used so often as like an insult uh, to the extent, I mean, I still have a lot of folks in my congregation who are, you know, of a certain age. And, uh, you know, when I talk about queer theology, they're like, I, can we say that word, right? Because uh, as they were growing up, that was regarded as an insult. Um, uh, and, uh, and so there's, you know, there's been this movement to kind of reclaim it. I think the trick has then come because, you know, uh, LGBTQ plus is, is so expansive, you know, and we're kind of 
coming yeah. to understand that there, it's so complex and there's so many different identities kind of under this umbrella that I think just for, for brevity's sake or communication's sake, a lot of folks kind of had begun to use queer as just like this umbrella term, right? It's just like anybody who's LGBTQ plus uh, is under the queer umbrella, right? Anybody who is not a cisgendered heterosexual person. Correct. Absolutely. Which, I mean, which to be honest with you, like this is still, um, I think for me is still something I would like to see us as a culture kind of get beyond of that idea of like, this is normal. And so everything else then has to go in this separate category. Um, yeah. and, and I think that um, we're getting closer. A lot of, you know, social scientists and behavioral and psychologists are starting to really figure out, they're like, oh, this, this umbrella, all of this has always been part of the human experience to have all of these different expressions of gender, of sexuality, of identity. And that purely being heterosexual is actually just one of those in, in all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which is um, so sort of this kind of study and stuff is um, queer theory, which is which is a social sciences study that's done a lot of progress in understanding, um, you know, human identity in, in this way. Um, and so like queer theology then kind of puts together our God talk uh, yeah. with um, sort of um, this theory that like this is heterosexual is one sliver out of a, a whole rainbow, a whole spectrum, a whole whatever you right. want to call it of yeah. how we as humans I identify ourselves. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, one of, uh, again, the other theological giants that you're going to be having on your podcast, uh, Reverend Lenny Duncan, uh, in his new book, United States of Grace on Shelves Now, um, <laughs> and, and available in audiobook form. Um, he, in this, in this book, he talks about how uh, this, this kind of narrative around the margins, right, marginalized identities, uh, can actually be really harmful because for folks who live in, you know, or who occupy these marginalized identities, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's still this idea that somehow we are on the outside. Um, and there are some folks who really love to reclaim that and be like, yes, we're proud to be on the outside, come to the outside with us, there shouldn't be an inside. Uh, and um, what uh, Reverend Lenny talks about, though, is that, you know, he lives in the margins, this is his world. Uh, and to say that somehow it's other when in the reality, you know, the norm, mm -hmm. <laughs> historic norms are actually the outside for him. Uh, and so it's really interesting to kind of, um, to switch the perspective that where the margins could actually be the center and the norm um, uh, and to understand that there isn't necessarily even a center, but that there is just a variety, right? Um, right. So yeah, absolutely. Well, and also I just wanted to say a second with about this norm uh, that we have of um, at, at some point in time, and by some point in time, I mean the year 1215 when the Catholic Church decided. So 1215, not in Jesus' time, not before, not, not even for the no. first, you know, no. 1200 years of the Christian Church. No one gave a shit. It was 1215 <laughs> when the Catholic Church finally decided, oh, um, marriage is for procreation purposes only, and that is specifically one man and one woman. Um, so for the first 1200 years of the church, the church didn't concern itself with any sorts of, of this. Um, this is yep. when that kind of came about, um, which is also something that, you know, is kind of fun to then, you know, resort of deconstruct the Bible. And if you look at a lot of the relationships that you see in the Bible, very, very few of these yeah. fall into this category of one man, one woman procreation purposes. Absolutely. And I mean, so they've they've now historically kind of dug up that uh, before 1215, there are, are actually same gender, um, you know, union wedding rights, you know, that were actually commonly practiced. It wasn't kind of uh, this outlaw ban thing. Um, well, also and, before 1215, the church didn't concern itself with those. Those were those yeah. were um, state matters. Right. The church, I mean, the church wasn't doing weddings at all. Uh, right. right. It was. Uh, <laughs> It was kind of when, you know, you got this literally lovely theocracy that uh, a lot of this mess even began, right? So this idea that like the Bible says marriage is between one man and one woman, and that's the way Christian church, is. well, actually. Um, well, first of all, it doesn't, and. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I even begin to tell you how wrong you are? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, all that is to say, right? That, I mean, and I think that's just one example of the fact that like, this isn't how the Christian church always was. Theology has really uh, grown and evolved in many different ways uh, and oftentimes in not 
great ways because of kind of who was in power and how power was obtained and all that other kind of mess, right? I mean, we probably don't have time to go through 2,000 years of horror, but um, (laughs) there's a lot there, uh, you know, but... um, yeah, but, I think, <laughs> but, but I think it's good at least to kind of have like a, a, a at least a basic yeah, understanding some, some that there history. is a per, right you know that Which there is, is part a of like that deconstruction thing right like we Absolutely. we need to say as as part of um one's growth in in their own theological view and hopefully in a deepening of your faith is yeah. to first understand how historically things kind of arrived mm-hmm. to where they are and when yeah. historically they began so to understand yeah. that this homophobic bible did not begin with jesus or paul or anybody thereafter that began much later that this idea that all of a sudden the church is holding marriage against queer people that idea began much later like none of these things yeah. are actually there um and so that can be a helpful step and and yeah. you know you got to deconstruct so then we can um you know you know kind of build back up but chris when exactly did we start inserting homosexual language into the bible I'm so glad you asked. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think it's also helpful to understand that there, I think, you know, the last time uh, uh, that I was an honored guest here, uh, we talked about how the importance of uh, knowing that there's different translations of the Bible and mm-hmm. how a lot of times, yes, they might kind of be hitting generally the same stories, narratives, that sort of thing that uh, linguistic translations uh, oftentimes are decided by teams. Uh, by uh, or individuals, and a lot of times they are influenced by uh, who uh, who's at the table, right? Like who's in the room mm-hmm. making these decisions, um, and, and how exactly does that happen? And so um, uh, the word homosexual um, uh, actually does not appear in uh, our English translation of the Bible until the 1940s. Uh, what? And Say what, I, Chris? Until I, like World I, War II? <laughs> I'm telling you, no homosexuals before then, apparently. They came um, up with that in my grandparents' life. It's true. Yeah, right? Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, and so I, I just think it's interesting to kind of uh, these little tidbits, right? But so basically its introduction um, comes at a time when the, the concept of homosexuality, um, it was also uh, growing in terms of this growing field of psychology, um, psychotherapy. Uh, And so at the time, there were different understandings of homosexuality. Uh, One of my favorites um, that I I feel like I fit into this category is the true pervert, Um, uh, (laughs) uh, where it's actually, there were were levels of of homosexuality. um, And the true pervert was one who was just gay, like didn't bother anybody, wasn't right, like, um, and that was it. There was a kind of a promiscuous homosexuality. And then there was one that was actually uh, a harmful um, homosexuality uh, where there were predators um, who were homosexuals. Yeah. And, uh, and so um, as these different understandings of homosexuality are emerging um, and, uh, you know, some of those laws are starting to be considered uh, mental diseases, uh, in a way, um, that, that lower rung, that predatory, um, uh, rung, uh, is really important there because, um, uh, the word that often gets translated, uh, at least the ones that Paul writes with, um, that talk about homosexuality, uh, the word arsenicotai is actually, um, uh, believed to be a slang that Paul might have even made up. Um, uh, we're not entirely sure exactly what it means, um, but the general understanding, at least before the 40s, uh, was that it typically was referencing um, child molesters mm-hmm. uh, and the people who were predatory in their sexual practices. Uh, and so, well, and people that also like in a few places where um, like older men would would like buy young boys oh, for this purpose. Right. Yes. Right. Exactly. Right. So it's it's human trafficking uh, in addition yes. to you know sexually predatory behaviors, uh, and so. Um, when those two kind of get lumped together, Mm -hmm. what happens then is when this team of biblical translators comes together and they get to this word that's always been kind of translated as child molester um, uh, or predatory uh, sexual um, uh, individual, uh, they're like, oh, that sounds kind of like this lower rung of homosexuality. And so what they did was they kind of just squished them together and they're like, well, uh, that kind of is the same as this. So that must be what this means. And so they just lumped 
uh, it all together, which, as we know, is still a horrible, horribly common practice where uh, homosexuality um, or queerness is conflated with um, pedophilia and yeah. predatory sexual behavior. Um, and so this is evident uh, in, you know, back in the 1940s already in terms of how it even got into the Bible. Yeah, and really just creating a monster and um, a Ooh, yeah. whole, whole bunch of, of, you know, an entire culture of Christian prejudice. Yeah, well, and so that is where uh, then the anti-LGBTQ theology actually starts coming from. So when you're talking about 1215, uh, you know, that obviously was a benchmark in some ways. Um, and it's not really until the 40s when that word gets introduced that um, more concrete system, theological systems uh, that are um, specifically and intentionally anti-gay uh, start emerging. That was yeah. Even I mean, there's still 700 that. years between you know 1215 and the 1900s, yeah. right? So it's like there's true. Is... <laughs> A few, just a, a little bit of time, you know. Um, uh, so yeah, it wasn't even very common to be like it. It just was not really a thing. A lot of Christian churches or Christian theologies were even that super concerned about um, mm -hmm. up until that point. But then yeah. it became a point, and then it didn't. Uh, and so then it kind of just took off, um, and that is where we have ended up with so much of the fire brimstone. You know, that's kind of where. The conversion therapy emerges out of uh, that is where a lot of the more conservative evangelical fundamentalist uh, um, theology comes out of that as well. Uh, it all is just this hot stew of awful uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of the um, kind of different denominations of the Christian church that were emerging at that time um, who kind of were using that as uh, an opportunity to scapegoat, which also happens to be a biblical concept. Um, <laughs> thanks, scapegoats. And that's why the devil is a red goat man. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if we want to go down that rabbit hole either. But That can be a whole separate podcast, the, uh, Perfect. the devil red goat man. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> and so a lot of these harmful then theologies um, really break down to, I think around six major passages and the entire Bible, like six verses. It's um, and um, we often refer to them, and by we, I mean uh, the queer community, as the clobber passages. Um, <laughs> these are the go-to phrases for any conservative right-wing evangelical mm. that hates the gays, wants to throw at you. Put the on their sign and go to their mm. anti-gay rallies. The biggest um, love there's them, exactly six of them. Mm. Yeah. And um, as one of our resources we'll give you today, I'm just, we're not going to talk about them. We're not going to waste breath on these because it's really just, it's... It's not worth it. It's um, true. Yeah. <laughs> I will but, be happy to send you my PowerPoint presentation if you want. <laughs> yeah. Um, some people might actually. Um, so I'm just going to put just a link um, of, of a good resource about debunking these clobber passages. Again, if you take a yeah. little time to, to learn, to exegete, to spend a little bit of time um, with the historical context, with the you know, the, uh, you know, written context with the language itself, um, you'll find that none of these passages actually hold up to um, what those individuals like to use them for. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you have like Son and Gomorrah, you know, when we're talking about the sexual predatory acts, like that is referring to gang rape. And later on in Ezekiel, we hear that like the really even bigger sin about Sodom and Gomorrah is that they weren't hospitable for their neighbors. Yeah. When you get into the ones where Paul talks about it, it's this word, word phusis, which is really just like the natural order. And uh, Paul also thought that like, uh, you know, that women with short hair, uh, that was unnatural um, uh, and against God's desire. Uh, but um, it can he also, also uses this same phrase about the natural order um, in positive context too. Like it's not just a well, you know, it just exactly right. And so this is the other way of interpreting that in the natural order is that um, going against your own nature, right, mm -hmm. um, is what he can Paul considered uh, the issue there. So if you are um, you know uh, cishet and you are uh, kind of you know acting as uh, uh, a queer individual or behaving a queer individual like that's not really according to your nature and vice versa so that mm -hmm. like anyone who is going against who they know themselves to be if chris pretended to be straight just to fit in somewhere that would be 
you know? I tried. It was exhausting. <laughs> uh, 30 years uh, of just, yeah, being tired. Anyways, <laughs> if you are experiencing people coming at you with yep. these clobber passages, um, please refer to, um, to this resource as well as some other resources. Mm -hmm. And then I also just want to say to you individuals that are experiencing this, um, we hear you and yeah. it sucks and it's oh, hard yeah. yep. and you can't argue with them. It's not, they're not going to hear it. They're not interested yeah. in hearing it. They're not interested yeah. in a reasoned biblical um, answer. Because um, the, the deeper issue is, okay. is not their understanding yeah. of the Bible. It's something much deeper in that person. Um, yeah. And you're not probably going to be able to fix them, which is sucks. But also right. to say that like people do grow and change and learn, but they have to do it at their own pace in their own That's way it. and with their own life experiences. Um, oh, yes, exactly. Right. And so, uh, and on that, you shouldn't have to, that's not your job, right? right. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you shouldn't really have to go through and do all this research. Uh, if it is helpful for you and life-giving for you, um, yes. uh, amen, please do this. Right. And it is not your job to go around and fixing other people's shitty theology. Mm -hmm. Um, right. Um, and so this is actually something when I, uh, when I came out to my dad, uh, you know, he explained it as like, uh, and I did talk about like my childhood sexual abuse in the same way. And, um, uh, you know, and so he started going to his own therapist and the therapist thankfully was like, yeah, uh, talk to, you know, essentially said, please <laughs> tell Chris that like, this is your journey, right? Like I am not responsible for my dad's journey. I yeah. cannot change it, right? Like he has to go through that on his own. And eventually, a few years later, right? Like we have an amazing, incredible relationship now. I wasn't sure how that was going to happen in the beginning, but um, but uh, but again, you are not responsible for someone else's theological right. journey and evolution. So, um, and also as a person who has gone through a a, a transformative theological journey, um, and you know maybe at one point in time, worse, you know, you can look back in your own past and 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 recognize things that you may have done that were harmful and stuff in this. Um, yep. Please process that in a way that's not placing that on an LGBT person. Yeah. Um, because quite often, um, especially in the church and you know, and I'm sure this happens, Chris happens to me all the time. Um, yeah. people meet a queer pastor and they want to tell you all of their stories about how shitty they used to be. And it's like, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, I don't have mm -hmm. anything to respond to you. Um, yeah. did you tell that person you were sorry for being shit? Mm -hmm. Um, that probably should be your first step. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, like I, I'm not here to give you absolution. Um, God can probably do that for you, but, um, just to anyways, just to kind of throw that out there that people yeah. do that to gay pastors all the time. Um, and, yeah. um, I have enough of my own anxiety. I don't need yours. Honey, <laughs> I would run out of Zoloft, uh, in days. <laughs> Anyways, just be conscious yeah. of that. Al yeah, Al absolutely. Now, allies, be conscious of that. Yes, I love that. Yes, mm -hmm. love that journey for you. Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, yeah. queer theology. Yeah. There are some beautiful gifts that are part of this deconstruction that queer folks have been able to give back in this umbrella of liberation theology based on mm -hmm. lived life experiences and how okay. we can look at the Bible this way. So, Chris. Yeah. What would you say are like some good scriptural situations where we can talk about um, a queer theological perspective and how that might be a little bit different than a traditional yeah. perspective and some of those gifts? Oh my goodness, how much time do we have? Um, so, uh, okay, so some of my favorites uh, um, uh, are the idea of the Trinity um, is really, you know, uh, I think is tremendously queer. Um, <laughs> In the sense that it's, you know, kind of, again, out of the norm of like what logic might, whatever. Um, yeah. But it's it's interesting. I always struggled with the Trinity and didn't really understand it until I actually started studying Hinduism, um, where I understood uh, they, I mean, in Hinduism, it's taught that like God is male, female, non-binary, uh, genderless, right? Uh, God is all, God is many, God is none, right? And so it's just like, it's not something that you have to like figure out. It just is. Yeah. Uh, and I love that, uh, because a lot of, I think part of my struggle in, in coming out so late is that like, I felt like I had to crack the code. I had to figure it out. I had to show my work, <laughs> right? Like how did I get to this answer? Uh, when the reality is that, uh, it's, it's not really something in need of a proof. It just is. 
Uh, and so when we hear in Genesis this idea that God said, let, let us make humanity in our image, yeah. mm, you know, um, uh, male and female uh, is all encompassed within the divine. Uh, uh, yes, yes, please. Thank you. Um, uh, love that. Um, and, and in the, in the, our image, which could be a great, you know, like, um, you know, sort of like, again, that, that kind of like kind of getting into sort of a more gender neutral term for God, yeah. which we, you know, which we don't often see, or just yeah. understanding that the, this God has always been in a yeah. plural sense. Absolutely. Uh, right. And that there's not just one understanding of God. Uh, a lot of these, uh, I mean, there's this whole history and throughout Hebrew scripture of the characteristics of God being ways to describe God and also being God, right? So the mm -hmm. glory of God, the wisdom of God uh, also ends up being like God uh, in a way. And it's just, uh, I, I think it's just fabulous that um, even the idea and understanding of God is transformative. Uh, mm -hmm. I think later on when we get to Moses uh, and uh, Moses is like, well, I mean, who am I supposed to tell these people, right? They're not just gonna listen to me. Like who is, whose authority is this under? And God's like, just say I am, right? Uh, and which can also be translated as I will be what I will be. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, you know, you want to talk yeah. about trans transformative identities um, and uh, a trans identity. That's it, right? Uh, um, I and am I that I am. Um, should be like a positive phrase for everybody in their own identity. And the fact that like, you know, God says this like pretty early into, into the Jewish scriptures, right? Like I yeah. am who I am. Don't it's try not, to put me yeah. in your boxes. Don't try to, you know, do yeah. all this. I ain't no daddy yeah. in the sky. I am Wait. who I am. <laughs> Anything I tell you is going to come up to it anyway. So, uh, <laughs> right. Um, so just say that. Uh, and, and I think it really uh, uh, has this lovely kind of bookend, so to speak, um, uh, uh, in looking at kind of the trans identity of God in, um, uh, uh, oh my goodness, Jesus on the mountain transforms. Why can't I remember the name to describe that event? Transfiguration. There you go. Thank <laughs> you. That was supposed to be harder than that. And I was like, I, I know. No, 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 no. I just, I have brain farts. COVID brain is real. Cool. Um, yeah, transfiguration. It literally means like the, the figure, the, the person experiences this change and goes through this. Um, and so Jesus uh, uh, takes on kind of the, this new identity. But what I love about both that experience and I am what I am, I will be what I will be, is it's not that all of a sudden uh, God becomes something different, but rather the veil is lifted, right? That was, that's what happens with Moses is that like, uh, you know, this, uh, this veil gets pulled back uh, and even being in God's presence is transformative um, in many ways. But it's not that God becomes something different, but rather God is revealed as who God has been all along but we it, are just finally like, getting to see god for who truly god is, is in a different and new way our collective understanding as a humanity um that is ever changing right like our yeah. collective understanding of who god is theology yeah. Uh, yeah. is is ever changing and that the, yeah. you know based on our experiences yeah yeah and that's the true change and our as in like collective all of us yeah yeah Right. Yeah. And which so you can even, see even woven in into the Bible, right? Like who who they understand the, who the I am is, who the creator is, has changed throughout the, the course of, of, of the, the history yeah. of the Bible. And you can hear that in the writings. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, and every single time. Right. Like it's on the side of challenging, um, you know, these old school traditional perspectives like yeah. that's not what the Bible is. The Bible is challenging those things. Absolutely. Um, and, and even yeah. like, you know, Jesus himself is like, listen, I did not come to do, what did he say? You the have heard it said, oh, but yeah. I mm -hmm. say to you and yeah, right, you know, right. change everything. Like he was, you know, an epitome of flipping yeah. all of their traditional theology on its head, right. right? Yeah, right. Like I'm not coming to abolish it. I'm coming to fulfill it. I, I am who I am, right? And, um, uh, and that's the beauty, I think, is that it's not necessarily that God changes, but that the perspective of others viewing God, they're the ones who are changed. We are transformed in that, you know. Um, uh, and I think also going through, you know, when you're talking about uh, the, 
you know, the marriage between one man and one woman. I think at last count, um, there were like over 40 different uh, biblical models of family um, mm -hmm. and uh, tons of different models of relationships, um, many of which are very healthy, actually, that are not uh, straightforward monogamous one man, one woman. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so culturally, it was very common um, to have multiple partners. Um, uh, polyamory was like a really, really big thing. Um, uh, culturally speaking, uh, um, and uh, it was kind of just understood. I mean, yes, it was generally more that the the male, you know, person would have more female uh, partners. But um, the reality is that that's, uh, it's not just that. You have Ruth and Naomi who develop a really special bond. It's not a romantic one, but like it's a new thing that comes when their spouses, you know, both die and they have kind of lost their ties to their home identities. Mm -hmm. They come together and essentially create a new family where, you know, um, uh, it's just like where you go, I go, your people are now going to be my people. And it's this new family. It's um, one of the most beautiful. That's honestly the what you just quoted is one of my most favorite and yeah. beautiful um, passages out of the Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, and it really speaks to the queer concept of created families. Yeah. That is all over the Bible. Uh, this gift that we understand that family isn't even just blood relations, uh, that family is really, really presented expansively and beautifully throughout scripture, that uh, it's it's not even just the, the blood ties, but created families are legitimate and real mm -hmm. <laughs> all throughout the Bible. Um, you, know, you have David and Jonathan who are, are never married yet. You know, at, at one point, David, you know, it is said that like he loved Jonathan more uh, than any woman in his life, um, and that there's this, uh, this really special bond, not to try to, like, say, oh, they were gay, right, like, I don't, I can't say that for sure, you know, but the understanding is that it's not this traditional kind of relationship, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, not this kind of toxic masculine, uh, understanding of it, um, I think is also beautifully queer, that, uh, to kind of look at things in a, in an expansive way, not just like an, a new way, but like a bigger way. It's so much bigger. God is so much bigger than we ever could have, uh, you know, described with any words um, mm -hmm. uh, that any author could do justice to. So those are some of my faves. Um, oh, and uh, also one of my faves in terms of um, uh, non-traditional gender understanding um, is the Ethiopian eunuch mm -hmm. uh, in Acts uh, when Philip kind of um, gets like, you know, booted out in the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and uh, encounters the Ethiopian eunuch, someone of really high position in Ethiopian society, um, was kind of in charge of the entire treasury uh, of the nation. Uh, and uh, it was kind of common practice at that point that um, a lot of the male figures that were closer to the, the queen in power um, became eunuchs uh, because then they were regarded as not like a potential threat to the queen um, mm -hmm. or, you know, to the kind of the, the power structure. Um, but it wasn't viewed as a shameful thing. Um, and so uh, really the first person to kind of get that we hear that gets like kind of officially baptized into this new emerging Jesus movement uh, is a, a, a queer, a gender queer black guy mm -hmm. uh, or gender queer black person, um, I should say, right? Um, uh, even though he still identifies with he, I think we also can make an argument that um, they uh, would also. Well, we don't have necessarily know that either. That just would have yeah. been, you know. Well, right, and that's so. That's how it's written, and so that's again yeah. something that you have, kind of have to also understand that context. How how many different. gender queer persons are still continually talked about and written about with their incorrect pronouns? Oh. <laughs> Uh, so just because someone wrote a story about this person right. doesn't mean... Precisely. Yeah, you have to understand context is so important with scripture. Well, especially uh, let's talk about this like probably 2,000 years before. Right. Um, I, yeah, much, much different understanding, of right? Like Pronouns yeah. and gender identity. <laughs> Exactly right. Like the the one of the other reasons why homosexual doesn't appear until the forties is that that concept was not really a thing. Even though queer people have always existed throughout time, it wasn't necessarily the same language or the same understanding or concept that goes along with it. So you always have to consider social historical concept concepts and context yes. uh, when reading scripture, and also understand that every single author, um, and there are a bunch, uh, wasn't just one person who wrote down the whole Bible. Um, uh, they all have their own lived experiences and their own perspectives and they're all their own internal biases, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and because they're human, 
um, even if we have this understanding that, you know, scripture is divinely inspired. Okay, great. Yeah, it's still being done by a human though. <laughs> and uh, humans are uh, not perfect. Yeah. And uh, and also the divine did not stop inspiring, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean that's an important thing to recognize too, right? That like yeah. this this feel like this is a finite amount of things we're allowed to say about God. Oh or my goodness, God's yeah. God's experience through humanity, and it's like, wait a minute, right. that doesn't like they didn't stop there. Yeah. Uh, oh, I mean, even through scripture, if we have this understanding that the idea and understanding of God evolves throughout scripture and theology, God talk evolves throughout scripture, it doesn't just stop with revelation. Yeah. Um, uh, right. Uh, and uh, just my quick PSA, there was only one revelation. I know the book seems like it goes on forever and talks about lots of different things. Uh, but if you ever see the word revelations, uh, please just throw a Bible at somebody because uh, that's <laughs> not the truth. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, right. And so you kind of have to take in all those uh, linguistic con contexts. Obviously, is hugely important. You know, even if we kind of understand that there's all these different translations, there's not always even going to be a direct translation. When yeah. you say, you know, this idea of, oh, it just, you know, something's lost in translation. That's not just like a lovely kind of phrase, right? Like it is super true. There's yeah. not always a one-to-one -one correspondence. Well, so I, um, I actually quite frequently um, preach about some of these concepts of things that like, because uh, part of my um, practice in sermon writing, um, and, and I think is somewhat common maybe, is I always go um, and look at the uh, original text, whether it's Greek or Hebrew. I'm a lot, yep. I did a lot better in my Greek class, class than my Hebrew class, I will be honest. Mm -hmm. yep, I was yep. really proud of myself when I could recognize when the the my Hebrew flashcards um, weren't upside uh -huh. down anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's about how that went. That is the realness. Yeah. So we had a wonderful and gracious professor who... Oh, God bless. Walked us through. Anyways, I did great in Greek. Um, no. And so um, it's helpful to me because I also, one of the gifts of this to me um, that has been opened up through being able to look at the Greek scripture is the fact that like, I can see for myself kind of the etymology of this word and the yeah. different ways that it is and can be used and the different like meanings. Um, so that just because the one person decided it should be translated to English this way uh -huh. yep. doesn't mean that that is the infallible word of God. It's a translation. Um, and so to understand then, um, to, to look at that Greek and also um, to look at the difference in manuscripts, which now I'm probably talking above everybody's head, but to understand that like there are early, aka older versions of written scripture, and then there are later versions where someone else has made a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, right? Mm -hmm. And if you play the game telephone, when we get to those later versions, they've changed a lot of things, right? Added <laughs> things, <laughs> deleted things they didn't like. Yep. Um, and so the, you know, as, as a, any um, Bible scholar will tell you, you know, like the older, the better, as in like that's yep. the most authentic, um, closest to the original written work um that would have been there um and so i so for me personally i find that life-giving um and so you'll find that in in my preaching is like i think it's important to point those things out i think it's important yeah. to give people an opportunity um to read the bible in its originalness or to understand that because of how old this um language in a again a different language and yep. um, how old that it is means that there are, you know, um, different ways that it can be looked at. Um, and then that can be beautiful and life-giving for, for our faith. Absolutely. I, one of my other favorite things to do, I mean, it kind of depends on which, uh, you know, version or translation you're looking at uh, the Bible, but um, also look at the footnotes. Uh, <laughs> when you see there's yes. little kind of like letters that like point to footnotes down there. Some will provide, you know, kind of context notes that I think are great. Um, I love uh, the annotated Bibles because um, uh, they kind of offer uh, annotations for, you know, different sections and passages. But uh, the footnotes, especially a lot of times you will see other ancient authorities, you know, yes. say this, right? Um, and a lot of times it's kind of just like, eh, you know, um, uh, but in some ways it makes huge differences. So, yeah. I mean, even just in the recent gospel text we had of... Uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000 and then going and walking out on the water. The disciples are terrified. And Jesus says, hey, don't worry. Um, it, it is I, uh, right? 
the actual translation, it is, uh, Jesus says, it is, I am. Uh, Boom! Right. Mic drop! <laughs> Remember the I am? <laughs> um, everything's connected. Uh, that, I, but that is a huge difference, right? Yeah, and like pointing right. that out of like Jesus recognizing himself as this this God who is, right? Like that just, right. how how is that not like a focal yeah. point of the story. Like, how did we forget in our English translation that that's there? Yeah. yeah. Anyways, so these are some of the gifts of, of queer theology, right? Is it, it allows you the opportunity to, to open up and to look at things outside of, you know, maybe a, a I don't want to say norm, but right, that normal, that traditional right. perspective that has, traditional is a better word, traditional perspective that has been given to us right. throughout the centuries. And probably even more specifically, white European tradition. Yes. Right? Uh, yeah. I think there, you know, a lot of the versions of, uh, you know, Christian theology that we have in the United States, a lot of them are white European versions of Christianity yes. and theology. And so also to be clear that when we look at the global church, uh, it, that even opens up all sorts of other doors, yeah. right? Um, uh, because they're they're going to be able to understand things in different ways too. So. And understanding that um, with you know within the global church and in different traditions, um, you know their worship and sacraments and practices look totally different than the European model that that we've been trained in. Yeah. Um, um, and based on you know their history and their human lived experience, right? Which is the key yeah. important phrase there for there it is. For, for any theology. Yep. Um, and and that's the beautiful thing that that I love about this I am this God that we have is this God is so big um, yeah. to allow room for humans to know God in whatever way in in their context to have relationships. Um, you know, their way, right? Yeah. And I think that's one of the, uh, another gift of queerness is this ability to kind of be expansive in our understanding and to, to look at things and, uh, uh, you know, and not just be limited in our understanding. I, I think queerness has shown us through uh, understandings of sexuality and gender that like, it's not just this either or, there's not this binary going on uh, and I think that absolutely holds true for God as well, that there's not necessarily, you know, the, the straightforward binary when we're talking about God or the church or the people. And there's all sorts of um, attributes, right, that are given to God. Um, I guess you like, started this, I probably cut you off, you know, um, but all of these okay. attributes given to God that don't oh, yeah. necessarily fit into this traditional mindset of a, of a daddy in the sky type of situation of this yeah. father, um, this authoritative father figure um that yeah. is one of many different um adjectives and languages and ways to describe god that we get throughout our scripture yeah um well yeah and it ties in with the cultural understanding where a lot of times men were you know the ones in power it, there was still a lot of patriarchal cultures and in many ways women were still in power at that time too Right. Yeah. So even though we're talking about kind of percentages, there's a majority or whatever, uh, you know, um, uh, some of the judges that were in power in Hebrew scripture, women, uh, some of the first disciples, um, some of the leaders in the early Christian movement, uh, the apostles, the apostles, all women. Um, uh, right. Uh, and uh, lest you get caught in that, you know, Timothy bullshit about I don't ordain women a tongue. OK. Really? Okay, so number one probably wasn't even Paul that wrote that, but um, and one of the reasons why we think that is because so, so many other places, Paul is like, yes, women, you're great, you're awesome, mm -hmm. you're doing the work of the church. Um, uh, and so I, I think that's something we have to take into consideration uh, and understanding that the divine feminine is also something that kind of got lost through history yeah. uh, in the Christian church um, as you know, shit got even more patriarchal. Uh, you know, when you're talking about the attribute of wisdom in Greek, uh, that that word is translated as Sophia, uh, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that it, even that was an attribute of God, and was acknowledged that the divine feminine was a real was was God was really God, and Sophia was venerated as as wisdom as god and unfortunately the divine feminine has kind of got squashed in a lot of ways but that's my right niece's there. middle name by the way so yeah. anyways uh yeah so there is this it's also a part of a sort of a homophobic mindset is this idea of like hyper masculinity right and yeah. so um in our culturalness of of this hyper masculinity that like men do these things and it 
people would call you something if you, you know, that sort of like men can't paint their nails, men can't, I, just yeah. all the things that men are not allowed to do in order to be masculine, right? Um, and so how this mindset has continued to permeate our, our cultural and social norms, they have also been placed on God, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, then all of a sudden we can't talk about God with, with, with feminine attitudes, that God clearly yep. is he always, and there is no... Um, can I tell you, I visit churches' websites like when I'm popping up or I'm like, you know, just Googling theological things and it, it pops up on different churches. I can yeah. always tell instantly when I go yeah. to and and they have like the capital H E he for God throughout the whole thing. I was like, oh, we're not going to get along. I can just no. already tell by yeah. that one yeah. little yep. thing because that tells me your limited narrow view of God right yep. away. Yep. Um, and uh, again, uh, one of the other uh, theological powerhouses you will be having on, I believe, to talk about feminine liberation theater. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so uh, Dr. Uh, Kristen Largen, uh, incredible, incredible human, um, uh, was blessed to also have her uh, as a professor at seminary, as you did, uh, uh, has this great line that I love is there's not anything inherently wrong with using uh, male adjectives or pronouns to describe God, there is something inherently wrong in exclusively using yeah. male pronouns to describe God, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, is right there. It's not like we're trying to erase or get rid of all this other stuff, but just understanding the table's so much bigger. Come on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, and I think. Well, and I also would re be remiss, I think, if, you know, even when we're talking about queer theology, uh, liberation theology, to understand that intersectionality is very real, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, um, and not just that, like, uh, not with the understanding that, okay, like a, a queer Black person is going to have extra oppression. I mean, oftentimes that is unfortunately very true, but the understanding that um, a queer Black person is going to have a distinctly different lived experience, lived truth, right, uh, mm -hmm. than a queer white person. Um, uh, so I don't know if you can even see my shirt I'm wearing. Uh, folks who are listening to this online can't, but uh, it says support Black, queer, and trans people. Um, uh, and it's, so I think when we're talking about queer theology, we have to understand that it's, even that <laughs> is, um, uh, is so much more expansive than what even we've been talking about today. Right, mm -hmm. we're kind of presenting it with our lived experiences, what we have understood to be true and meaningful for us. And that is also not to say uh, that there is uh, so many other different facets of um, queer liberation theology, particularly when you get in, uh, involved in something beyond who we are, right? Mm -hmm. um, our identities. So. Yeah, um, and and just to recognize that there's a, a lot of those intersections, right? And even as yeah. um, you know, as, as a woman, right. Having that intersection of, um, you know, yeah. being a woman and being queer comes with, you know, intersection of feminist theology and, and queer theology. Um, and, you know, again, it's yeah. not playing that we're not, we're not playing the marginalized, you know, uh, yeah. Olympics here of who has the most marginalized tokens in their corner. Uh, yeah. but to recognize that, you know, all of these persons have thing or things that, are a part of who they are in their identity that automatically um, makes people be shitty towards you. Yeah, well, and you know- I'm, That's just the most basic way I can explain <laughs> marginalized right, identities. Right. Well, yeah, and again, historically, we've been pitted against each other, which is such bullshit, right? Uh, you know, that there's only so much and you all have to fight for the scraps of what, you know, uh, the people in power don't want essentially. And I'm like, well, that's bullshit, right? Um, <laughs> uh, how much stronger would we be together? And Let's how much stronger that. is our theology when we're together, right? So even you and I are going to have different understandings of queer theology as yeah. you're, you're, you know, you're more femme, I'm more mask. Um, uh, and um, uh, right that like when I get to sit at the feet of, of elders and, you know, incredible theologians in the Black community, um, uh, uh, in the, the disability community, right, all these other kind of yeah. different um, identities, uh, my theology becomes stronger when I get to experience the wisdom and understanding and lived experiences of other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, again, I think it's just this great gift that, like, you know, we, we become stronger for that. It's not a matter and then of who's right, how who's wrong. these other per perspectives and stuff can influence, um, you know, our understanding of God yes. um, and our relationship, which, you know, you're just pointing out like, I wonder why Pastor AJ does this podcast and talks about all these things. <laughs> like, 
why would we yeah. talk about black theology and queer theology and feminist yeah. theology oh maybe yeah. because of then it helps us to inform us like maybe you know you've never identified as a feminist before in your life but there's yeah. something I, I guarantee you there will be something that the reverend dr kristen johnson Largen will say that will resonate <laughs> with you a little bit and make yes. you think a little bit more about your faith and how you understand god yes yeah. um and for me one of the beautiful many gifts of queer theology um is the fact that like we don't have to put God in any kind of box, right? Mm -hmm. That that God can be inclusive of of all yeah. of any language that you want to use for God. Let, let's be clear: God doesn't have a gender, right? <laughs> right. So if God doesn't have a gender, oh my gosh, doesn't that right. open up our field of understanding and 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 our relationship with God like so yeah. much oh, by oh being goodness. able to understand that then all of these all of these different, you know, gender identities that like, I don't even understand, right? Because that's not my lived experience. Um, yeah. I, you know, like all of that can be inclusive within this God, right? Uh, that yeah. everyone then can see themselves as made in this image that we made that's them, it. we made them in our image. Yeah. And that everyone yeah. um, is included within that image, regardless of of any of these things that humans have tried to tell you. Here, yeah, don't let the, the limitations of the English language uh, limit yeah. your theology, right? Uh, you know, the, uh, the Finnish language actually has a pronoun uh, strictly for the divine that is genderless. Uh, and that, my God, I wish sometimes that we- <laughs> Why are they so much better than us all the time? <laughs> all the time, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, the Finnish Lutherans in particular, Man, their theology is. Just... Oh my gosh, and they have like a whole different way of conceptualizing Christ than we can even understand. Yep. Um, that it's like mind blowing. It's like uh, wow. Yeah. Again, They're a just... whole other. We could take up a whole other hour just talking about that. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. finished Christ. That actually oh. would be a great episode. Again, probably have the Reverend Doctor Christian Johnson Larson explain that to you because that's probably the best person yeah. to be able to do that. But. Anyways. Uh, or the Reverend Doctor uh, Sterna. Um, also. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, being the finished powerhouse that. I mean, anyway. like, good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyways, um, thanks so much. With I haven't paid attention to time at all because that's just how like wonderful conversations um, I mean, go like this. Um, uh, and I want to be yeah. clear that Pastor Chris and I have just like barely scratched the surface. Like, there is so much Ooh, that, yes. that you can get into, um, and we have quite a few good resources. That if you're a person that's like maybe struggling to articulate some of your theology or, yeah. or just still interested in more of these things, um, that here are some, some good resources from um, people that are way smarter than us um, <laughs> that can explain it really well. Yeah. Um, and also if you're a person who in your own queer identity are still looking for your language um, to yeah. talk about God, to talk about your own faith, again, these are great resources to, to help set you on your way. Um, sure. So I have just um, one that I'm going to share. Um, and that's because, um, you know, uh, Chris has like a thousand better ones. <laughs> um, and that is, um, this is like basic. This is as basic mm -hmm. as it gets. If you want to learn more about queer theology in the most comprehensive, non-pastory kind of language out there from someone who is smart and educated, um, this is a really good um, um, book. It's called Radical Love, Introduction to Queer Theology um, mm -hmm. by the Reverend Dr. Patrick Cheng. Uh, who is an, uh, an Episcopalian priest and um, a professor. He also has a Juris Doctoris because... Why not? Why not, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, In and your so, spare time. <laughs> yeah, I just, you know. Mm. And what are some other resources um, that people oh. can look up? Sure. So uh, um, uh, again, I'm going to, well, I'm going to describe it and show it because I know that there are folks who watch this and who just listen to it, but mm -hmm. um, a really good baseline, I think, for a uh, kind of um, our introduction to a lot of different liberation theologies, uh, introducing liberative theologies, um, uh, kind of assembled by Miguel de la Torre, who, uh, whew, uh, another, you want to talk about liberation theological powerhouse. Yeah. Woo! Matt, one. Um, uh, also love uh, queer virtue. Um, uh, by the Reverend Elizabeth Edmond. Um, uh, and this is, I think, really great in looking at the gifts uh, that kind of exist in queer identities and queer communities um, and how that can really help in understanding uh, God and theology. Um, 
a specifically kind of trans uh, theological perspective, um, mm -hmm. transforming um, Austin Harkey. Uh, highly recommend that. Um, uh, a kind of a non-white um, uh, queer theology perspective outside the lines, uh, Mahi can part. Um, and then for a lot of the um, kind of biblical history around the language, um, uh, when, you know, we we're talking about like, when does homosexuality start in the Bible, that sort of thing. Um, uh, uh, Kathy Balduck has done some really, really great research in that and looking at biblical translations and histories. Um, and so our book, uh, Walking the Bridgeless Canyon, um, I think has some really, uh, um, good if you, you know, like history and, uh, you know, perhaps a little bit more in the nerdy side of things, but um, I think it's a really helpful approach to kind of understanding timelines and, and mm -hmm. it, it still is very accessible, even though there's a lot of information in there. Um, I think all of those are very accessible, regardless of your experience or exposure to, you know, other stuff. I have, I lied. I have one more. Um, oh, great. Uh, uh, Our Lives Matter, A Womanist Queer Theology mm, by mm, um, mm, mm. Pamela Leitze. Um, yep. Just, I mean, anything she talks about. Oh, uh, yeah. That, uh, yeah, that book's in my office. I don't, <laughs> so I can't show it here. <laughs> Thank you for including it. Yeah. I it just like, as you're talking, I was like, oh, yeah. what did I do? Like, just yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. She's a, oh. she's a pretty big, um, would be in the area of, of public theology is yeah another realm yeah but, mm -hmm. yep 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 well thanks chris for coming and joining us and talking oh. about you know some of our fun uh hot topics here my honor and pleasure as uh -huh. always uh -huh. yes um well everyone um thanks for joining us and you can find us next tuesday on shit they don't tell you on sunday um with our last um liberation theology guest for the mini series so um please come back for that um um, just really excited about having all of these awesome guests on here. Um, this is just, you know, one of my really? selfish things is when I get no. to talk with them. Anyways, <laughs> um, uh, subscribe wherever it is that you listen to podcasts or on Facebook um, so that you can get the, the newest episodes uh, and hear about what's coming out. Um, and as always, share this with friends and family, um, especially episodes like this uh, of a person that you know maybe needs to hear this or maybe could use the realm of exploring. Um, but, but please um, share this far and wide. This podcast is for everyone. Um, it's not just for pastors, qu quite the opposite. Um, <laughs> our, our hope is that we can share um, the stuff that we know um, and we care about with all of you. Anyways, take care, everyone. Bye.